Yesterday, First Minister Nicola Sturgeon announced the first steps in their plan to lift the lockdown in Scotland. She joins me now. Um, obviously, it's very good to see you. Thank you for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. You've outlined this, this roadmap. I wonder if you felt under pressure to sort of fall in line with England because Ruth Davidson was on earlier on GMB and she said, you're just following Boris Johnson and it was like watching t a TV channel on Plus One. I think that's just silly, actually, and I'm not sure it's what people want to hear right now. What we're trying to do is plot a, a careful and cautious path forward that allows us to get back to some kind of normality, but doesn't run the risk of the virus uh, getting out of control again. Uh, we, over the past few weeks, have felt that it was too early to release these measures. The so-called R number, the transmission rate of the virus, we think is still a bit higher in Scotland because we had our first cases later, so we're a bit behind that curve. So I'm determined to do what's right for Scotland. That's my job and, and responsibility. All countries are going to be looking at the same things, though, because we're all trying to unlock exactly the same things. So if you look at, as I have been, uh, these uh, route maps from all sorts of countries, not just other countries in the UK, but Ireland and, and countries across Europe. There's a great similarity between them. But what's important is that we do it at the right time and at the right uh, sequence, in the right sequence. And that's what I'm trying to do. I, I think just now I've tried throughout this whole crisis not to get party political because these issues are too important. It's really important that the opposition parties ask tough questions and bring real scrutiny to bear. But I'm not sure many people have patience for kind of silly party political games being played just now. And I think when, when you have people doing that, I, I kind of think it reveals more about them than it does about me or or the yeah. Scottish government. So I'll keep focused on the job at hand. Because you have had, there has been accusations, hasn't there, a lot, and you know there has, of you, if you like, using this crisis to further Scottish independence. You were accused this week of enjoying the situation. The reporter concerned, it has to be said, did apologise to you. But there has been a lot of that. How do you deal with that? I, I try to tune it out. I mean, I can say hand on heart that I have never enjoyed anything less in my whole life. This is grim. It's grim for everybody having to deal with the lockdown. It's particularly grim for the, the far too many people who've lost loved ones and for anybody in a position of leadership, regardless of their politics, regardless of their views on things, this is not easy. You're taking decisions that are really tough. There are no good options in front of us. And, and so the idea that anybody relishes this in any way is, is just nonsense. And I think most reasonable people understand that. And on politics and the constitution, I don't think I've mentioned the word independence. I'm not interested in traditional politics or constitutional arguments over this. And, and, you know, people can believe that or not. From day one, all I care about is trying to do everything I can to get this virus under control and get the country back to normal. Uh, one of the things that we all have to understand is that the virus hasn't gone away. We're making new progress against it, but it's still out there and it will be ready to pounce as soon as we give it the chance, which is why, yes, we need to get back to normal, but we will have to live our lives a bit differently for some time to come, potentially until the scientists working on a vaccine get the breakthrough that all of us want them to have. So until then, I'm just going to focus as hard as I can every single day on doing the right things. I've, I've been candid all along. I will make mistakes. I will have made mistakes. I don't think any leader or government in the world will not have made mistakes, and we learn from them as we go, but at every single step. I know I and my ministerial colleagues here in Scotland were just trying to take the best decisions based on the knowledge and information we have at the time uh, and take these decisions for the very best of reasons. Because you said something very, very interesting yesterday, which was this isn't a popularity contest and you have mm -hmm. to make tough decisions. Now, lots of politicians find that very, very difficult because they want to be liked. They don't like delivering bad news. But you said, really, you should not be afraid to be unpopular, particularly now. You can't be, in, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm a politician. No politician likes to be taking decisions that will be unpopular. And, and so I'm, I'm not immune from all of these you know, normal feelings that politicians have. But I've, I've tried very hard and will continue to try very hard during this to put all of that aside. I've very deliberately not criticised other leaders in the UK in particular, because I, I believe that while we might be coming to slightly different conclusions on things, we're all trying to do the best, and it can't be a popularity contest. You know, for the last two months, I've been asking people in Scotland to live their lives in a way that none of us would, would or could have contemplated uh, not too long ago. So you know, that can't be driven by what I think is popular. It has to be driven 
by what I judge is right to keep this virus under control and get the country back to normal. And I do believe in, you know, maybe I'm, I'm uh, you know, being overly optimistic here, but I don't think so. I, I think when you treat the public like grown-ups and just be straight with them about what we do know, what we don't know, what we're learning, the, the really difficult decisions along the way. There's no risk-free option in front of us right now. As we start to lift these measures, you know, my heart will be in my mouth a lot of the time uh, looking at the data about what's happening with the, the virus. And there's no easy options where the lockdown has caused harms, but it's been necessary to control the virus. And, you know, sometimes I feel just now, and all leaders will be the same, that we're taking decisions to try to reduce harm in one area, but risking increase it in another area. So we've got to find the best balance. And I think if we're honest with the public about that, then the public might not be thrilled. Of course, they're not about the way we're having to live our lives just now, but there'll be an understanding of what we're trying to do and how we're trying to navigate it. Well, it's interesting because you're a very, very experienced politician. But when you're talking like that and you're saying that, you know, your heart's in your mouth and you're, you're concerned, you showed a really human side. You were asked in Parliament about deaths in care homes, which has, as we know, been absolutely heartbreaking. And this is what you said. I don't think there is a single one of us who does not find this a deeply and profoundly upsetting uh, situation. So please do not... Uh, ask these questions in a way that suggests that we are not all trying to do everything we possibly can to do the right thing. Now, on the situation... Excuse me, President Officer. Well, you could see there the emotion, and, and it is one of the real tragedies of this crisis, what has happened in care homes, not just in Scotland, all over the UK and indeed in other parts of the world. Do you, do you have regrets about how that was initially handled and that we could have done something better? We could have, been, we could have protected our elderly a bit more? I don't think any politician and, and, frankly, any human being could look at the situation right now and not agonise over, could we have done things differently, could we have done things better? So every day right now we're trying to do everything we can and, and adapt our response as we learn more about this virus. But if I look back, and, and one of the easiest things in the world right now is for people to apply hindsight that we didn't have at the time and say, oh, you should have done everything different. But if, if we go back to the point at which we started to try to get older people who shouldn't have been in hospital, you know, the so-called delayed discharges out of hospital. One of the things we knew then was that our hospitals were about to be filled up with coronavirus cases. So to have kept older people with no medical need to be in hospital where they were would have been putting them at enormous risk as well. Um, so, you know, yes, you can apply hindsight, but we try to do the best things at the time. People say we should have tested more. And, you know, again, there are legitimate issues, legitimate questions here, but back then, we didn't think that testing people without symptoms was something that was scientifically and clinically an effective thing to do. There are still doubts about that, but we do it more now because our knowledge of the virus and particularly how asymptomatic people might spread the virus has changed. Our knowledge of this virus, I'm not a scientist and my knowledge is, is developing all along, but the scientific knowledge about this virus is changing and developing every day. So, yeah, it's dead easy to say if we knew everything that we know now then, we might have done things differently, but, but we didn't. We, we had to act on the basis of the knowledge we had. And the one thing I do always take exception to is this idea, not, not that people shouldn't ask questions, they should ask questions about this and we should learn as we go, but some of what you start to hear from some politicians that almost suggest we didn't care and, and we just, you know, sort of didn't think through what we were doing with older people. Nothing could be further from the truth. At every step, certainly speaking personally and for my government, we've tried to do the right things based on the knowledge and information we had at the time and that is what we will continue to do every single step of the way. Well, we're just about to talk to our Mark about masks, about face masks, mm. and it's been something that has divided opinion. What's the official line from you as far as mm. wearing a face mask or a face covering? What, what's the situation right now? Uh, well, I, I've been uh, very clear for some weeks now that w I want people to do that in certain circumstances. So if you find yourself in a, an enclosed space with other people where social distancing might be a bit more difficult, so that the examples we've given, if you're uh, in a shop buying food, if you're on public transport, then wear a face covering. And, you know, we've also been quite clear, the scientific evidence is not overwhelming on this, but there is some evidence and uh, an opinion that wearing a face covering doesn't necessarily protect you, but it may protect other people. If you had the virus and maybe didn't know about it because you didn't have symptoms, it could protect other people from you infecting them. So if there's any benefit to be had from this, I think we should do it. We've not made it mandatory, um, although we'll 
keep that under review. Mm -hmm. But obviously some people couldn't do it, people with asthma, for example. So th there will be some people that it's just not possible. But for most people, if you can do it, my strong advice is to do it in the kind of circumstances I've just talked about. Nicola Sturgeon, thank you for joining us thank this morning. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much indeed for, for giving us your time. Thank you.